So, the Lord has been um, talking to us about Cyprus for many years. And, and, and most of you remember, just 10 seconds or less, six years ago, the Lord told us we were coming to Cyprus in one week. Three miracles occurred that told us we were coming to Cyprus. One, that a high school buddy of mine was the healing room director of Cyprus. That was a miracle. Then the map of Cyprus fell out of our Bible. And then my father uh, drilled a 20-year lock safe and pulled out this coin set from 1960 and the founding of Cyprus. And we find that on our mantle when Sherry's cleaning. God has been talking Cyprus to us for years and years. Lord, we just yield to you. I, I confess to you and hope that you will forgive me with the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony that it was a miracle the map fell out because I didn't know where Cyprus was <laughs> until the map fell out. And then, and then I saw it's, well, it's right next to Israel. I mean, you know, Cyprus. Okay, Father, we hear you, Cyprus. So then we all know the story then. 2011, the Lord brings us here, and, um, and the Father keeps speaking about how important this nation is, as I point to the flag on the floor. And uh, so, and I say that just so that, you know, it's the old saying, we don't say that to everybody, you know, you know what I mean by that? You know, it's not like the, you know, I bet you say that to all the girls, but we don't. <laughs> we, no, is God, God actually has has called this nation for this purpose, you know. So the last time we came, there were four of us. This time the Lord sent 12. And 12 is the number of royal government. And so the Lord sends 12 of us here to Cyprus, you know. And, and all we know is that we love these amazing people here, right? That's all we know. We have no idea what's... We have no idea that our, our, our country is going to be threatening the one next to yours with war. We have no idea that, you know, all of these things are happening and all this pressure that... No, none of this was in the horizon when we're talking to Georgia and Greg about, hey, listen, we think the Lord's saying we need to come back. And so um, all of this is just God positioning and these kinds of things. So we came and we've been doing... Um, what we call land missions, which is one of the applications of what we call terraforming. So how many people have I lost in the last sentence? Did I lose a lot of... Anyway, so what we're doing is, is we are letting God run the show. Yes. Now, is that okay? Yes. Can we do that? Because, because God has a plan for all of creation, and we want to participate in that plan, right? And if God has something for us to do, how many people in this room want to say yes to that? Amen? So God sends us out on the land, and He begins shining the light of His presence, and He's showing us things about this nation because there's, there's positioning that God is doing relative to what He created Cyprus for, and how you choose. And so we're back because you've had two years of wonderful choices. Congratulations and let's praise the Lord. Yes, that was a proverbial pat on your back, just so you know. Great job. Congratulations. So we're coming in and, um, and the Lord's been talking to us about lots of things. And, and we've, been, we've been, what the word we use is dismantling. It would be the tearing down of strongholds, the things that are in this nation that are keeping it from being what it was created to be by God so that life is easier for you if all goes well <clears throat> and you are able to do what God created you to do. So the Lord has been showing us things related to, for example, the economy of the world and how the economy of Cyprus will affect that. And so the Lord's shown us these things, and he's, and he's taken us to places, and we just go wherever the Lamb tells us to go, we go. And he takes us to places. We, we, this time we went to Limassol. Hello, Limassol. It's good to see you all. And uh, so the Lord sent us to Limassol in order to find these things to dismantle. And one of the things that's so important to understand with what I'm about to share with you is that... We're not talking about a problem that we want to solve. We're talking about a destiny that we want to step into. Do you see the difference? Now, Sherry would say this as, 
We want to look at the covenant that God has with us, not the condition that's weighing us down. And so what God wants to do is open and release the floodgates of provision upon Cyprus. And now let's talk about why. Is the answer to the question why because there has been economic turmoil and we need to solve that problem? Well, yes, but not really. Really, what God is after is reconciling you to the reason you live here and not somewhere else. Greece, South Africa, UK, wherever. God has you here for a reason, and that reason is very important in what is going on in the world for His will done on earth as it is in heaven. Fabulous? Okay. Now, opening the floodgates of heaven, there are, is, is a totally different topic than um, whether there has been an issue in your family, um, whether or not um, you've disobeyed God or obeying God. All these different things are important. Don't erase them. But what we want to talk about very specifically today is God opening the floodgates and um, literally letting heaven pour into your lives. And I'm being very specific with that word, your lives, so that you can be the sons and daughters who release that to Cyprus and from Cyprus to the world. Do you see how God has a plan in all this? So when we say floodgates, we're talking about Psalm 144, which says that our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. So not just money, but yes, money, but not just money. What about time? How many people could use a few extra hours or ten in their day? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? What about networking? What about God connecting us to people that we have not had access to before that will enable Cyprus to see it's call of God done. It's call of God established. All of these things are provision. And God wants our barns full. Full. Vats overflowing with every kind of provision. Now, I'm going to return to this word and hopefully not overuse it. Because we really feel like God has a floodgate for you. And the other side of the floodgate is a flood. <laughs> and the flood needs to come rushing in. Amen? Amen? Okay. I'm trying very hard not to step. No, I'm just, yeah, I don't want to desecrate the, you know, it's trying to be. Yeah. The Americans are really particular about the flag. If it touches the ground, we have to burn it. So, seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, but this is awesome because we're being prophetic. And so I'm with you, you know. <laughs> Woohoo! I was going to walk on it, but I didn't want to, you know, offend anyone. <laughs> so um, 12 months ago, last month, so 13 months ago, the Lord began to speak to us in Tulsa. And he started the process of something. And I want to try not to overwhelm you with our emotion, but just to be as... Um, it just giving you the testimony of what God has done. In the last 13 months, we have seen the flood gates open. We have not seen the spillover. The spillover is 2%, 5% more than 100%. So 105, 107%. That's a spillover. This would be more like a thousand percent or five thousand percent percent. And what 
the Lord began speaking to us, and Sherry so boldly released to Blue Flame, which is our church and ministry in Tulsa. Everyone in our congregation responded to, and when I say everyone, I shouldn't say that. Many of the people responded and said, yes, I hear God, and I want to accept this invitation. And I, we need to emphasize invitation because this is not a law. This is not about whether you're going to heaven or hell. And it's not about whether or not you're going to be a good person or whether you're going to be successful or any of these different things. God has an invitation. Just like seven years ago, he invited us to give, give away everything. Then 12, 13 months ago, he said, try this. Test me on this, he said. And we did and what we saw astounded us because our barns are filled with every kind of provision. And I, and I, must, I must state this before. We had, we had years prior to this where it, it just seemed like everything was here and it was just dropping. You know, like, a, like that slow but certain free fall into zero. And, and everything's just lower, lower. Yes, yes. Can you go negative on this? It kept going down and down and down. And, and we're watching this happen. I remember um, a little over a year ago, we're talking to Sherry, and I'm just like, you know, something is not right. You know, we, I mean, we we're kind of eking by, you know, literally on fumes. And how is this happening? And, and what is God's plan? Because we believed that God had another plan. And God, oh boy, did he respond with another plan. And um, so what we want to do is share with you what the Lord showed us and, um, and allow that to be an invitation so that you understand that um, in our past, we have been traumatized by manipulation related to giving. And it's, it's beautiful because we just had two offerings and, and three quarters uh, and, and so, you know, it's like now after two and three quarters offerings, you know, let's, let's talk about giving, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the Lord, I'm saying, Father, wait, you know, I mean, that's a setup. No, the, the whole idea is for you to know that God wants to take the veil off of something that he has been giddy for you to see for, oh, 2000 years. Now, that's a big lead-up, I know, but well worth it, because um, what we saw in Tulsa astounded us. I don't know how to begin with the testimonies, but I'm going to give you some idea. We had people with doctor's bills, $10,000 and more, $20,000 doctor bills, and the doctor tore up the bill. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. We had people with multi-thousand dollar needs. And this friend of theirs from, you know, they're not even in Tulsa, but they, but they were a part of our, our uh, management team. And so they, did, they joined us and, and in the Colmas and what we're going to talk about. And they, um, they saw expenses literally just disappear, go away. God provided. We saw people and their monthly income increase so much it was almost a double all these different things that happening happening expenses going on we saw we had a revival of people being given cars what was it was it eight eight seven seven families received cars nice cars in in a short amount of time we saw people who were single find the person that God created for them like that it was like a floodgate a revival I mean literally all of a sudden this I mean we've been listen since Sherry and I started this post the bank every place we've been there's been single women especially and some men crying to us, why can't I find the one? And all of a sudden, we have a revival. I mean, people are laughing at us because everyone's getting married. 
We have a revival of babies being born. We've got, I know, yeah, I know some of you are like, time out. You had me until that. But, you know, there are people in this room who God has called to have a child and they're waiting to see what, when, how. And the Lord has showed us. I mean, we absolutely have revival here. We have people that were called of God into ministry. And and it was like there was a no, there was a no, there was a no. We step into this and it changes to yes. We have seen... um, Do you see... Our storehouses are full of every kind of provision. The, the teams, we have um, teams all over the world that, that pray with these keys, doubled in the last year. I mean, it's just incredible what we've seen. And last but not least, the financial provision, the inflow just took off the charts. Like literally, you know, like you've got the little graph going and it goes up and it disappears because it left the chart. Is everyone following? Okay. Um, I'm going to start and I'm going to say this. There's a saying that I heard about when I was at the bank right before I left from a very, very dear brother of mine. I had, I had a number of Christians that worked with me at the bank right before I left. Um, who believed in what was happening, sewed into our ministry as we left. And um, he said to me, he said, you know, if you take a goat, we said this in the conference a few days ago, if you take a goat that produces a gallon of milk or so many gallons of milk, you walk onto Israel and the amount of milk it produces doubles and a half as soon as it walks into Israel. You take it out of Israel, and it goes back to where it was before it went on to to that land. Now, the question that we want to have is why, and we would say, well, obviously, because that's the land God promised to his people, and, and that land is blessed and all of these things. But the Father began showing us how the Hebrew people, which we love, we bless, our heart yearns for the Hebrew people to see the truth of Jesus. But 2,000 years ago, many Hebrew people rejected Jesus as Lord. And shortly thereafter, the Gentile believers rejected the Hebrew people. And Constantine said some very painful things about the Hebrew people and basically distanced this religion of Christianity away from the Hebrew people. And much of what God gave to us as a blessing, we lost. And Jesus, our King of kings and Lord of lords, taught us in Matthew 5, went through the Beatitudes, and he said, I did not come to get rid of the the law, but to complete it. And he said, any person who teaches others or does not practice the law of Moses will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And any person who teaches and practices the law of Moses will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said not one bit of the law goes away. It's just fulfilled by him. And so what we, what we do not have is a set of rules to put ourselves back into the prison that we've spent all this time getting out of. Everyone say, praise the Lord. Law, as Sherry says, law leads us to love. That it's not the, the law of Moses that was meant to be this thing that trapped us, but the law was literally a description of love. And that re- Hebrew word in law actually has love in its root. That God was, was bringing to the people the roadmap to relationship because they refused to go up the mountain because they were scared. So he gave them the roadmap to relationship. And that roadmap to relationship was never meant for us to be discarded. And God has, has opened this door, taken the veil off, and is showing us something amazing. And we want to share it with you before we go. We found a pearl of great price in your land, and we don't want to leave without pointing it out to you. Is that okay? Okay. Well, then let's change our lives forever and ever and ever and ever and rest with assurance. This, this, this 
last 13 months for me was when the last in my list of serious things that I cried out to God for, every single one of them was fulfilled by God since we said yes to this. Um, for, for those who want to know what on earth the birds are doing in this room this morning, <clears throat> WOOT is an acronym when heaven overhears our testimonies. So when you have a testimony, you want to celebrate the testimonies of God, don't we? Okay, I'm going to read a, a, a Bible verse, a scripture to you that you've heard a thousand times. And for that, I apologize. But good news, we're going to open it up so that you can see what God was talking about. And I bless you um, as it changes your life. Again, it's an invitation. Okay, this is the prophet Malachi, and this is actually Margot, um, who is Malachi in many respects to me. She brings me the cool water that keeps me from losing my voice. Blessings, Margot. Malachi 3, 8 through 12, we know so well we could probably sing it. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and vines in your fields will not cast their fruit says the Lord Almighty, then all the nations will call you blessed. All the nations will call you blessed, Cyprus. And you, uh, for yours, will be a delighted, delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Okay. Now, let's talk about whole tithe. The word whole in Hebrew is kol, K-O-L. And kol is, is very simply everything. All. So that's the easy one. Whole. It literally means whole. Coal. Now the second word is masar is how we pronounce it um, because we're Americans and silly. Uh, in Hebrew, it would be ma'asar, and, um, but, but uh, masar is a much easier. Just take out the yod and it's much faster. So kol masar. Masar is a word that we've translated into many different languages, Greek is one of them, as being a tenth. But in Hebrew, it is a tenth with three different applications. And it is those three different applications that we have lost in the church. And this word offerings in Hebrew is teruma or teruma. And teruma is another word that we have not understood. We have called it offerings, and to us, we've given it a New Testament post-Jesus translation as meaning, give beyond your tenth wherever you want to. It's a free-for-all. Have fun. And, and we don't want to take the fun out of it because it's going to be there. But if God has rocket fuel for your Honda... That'll take the Honda to the moon. Let's put the rocket fuel in, shall we? Because Cyprus needs the rocket fuel because Cyprus is a rocket. Diesel is not going to do it. Okay, so um, we have the Teruma, which is the offerings, and the, the Masar, which is the tenth in three applications. 
And we're going to go through each of these, and you're going to have a marvelous time because, because this is not about guilting you about what you've not done. This is about rescuing the church of people who believe in Jesus Christ so that we can fulfill what we were called to with storehouses that are full and overflowing. Okay, so we're going to start with the Teruma, and, um, and I'm going to throw some more scriptures out at you because I want you to know that this is all in the Old Testament, and it always has been. The Hebrew people follow this to the letter to this day, and they have prospered mightily because they know what the Kol Masar is. They know the difference between a tithe and the whole Masar, which is, which is every application God has. Okay, so the Truma, uh, Numbers 18.8. Then the Lord said to Aaron, I myself have put you in charge of the offerings, that's the Teruma, presented to me, all the holy offerings the Israelites give me, I give to you and your sons as your portion and regular share. One of the big things that we have totally missed out on is the Teruma. The Teruma is not a free-for-all offering. It is a very specific um, Blessing that we give to God directly through the, in the Hebrew, it would be the Kohen or the priests or uh, the, the spiritual mentor God has placed in your life, which for most of you in this room would be Georgia, uh, Georgia and Greg. Okay, now, um, that, you know, poor them. So see, they almost tried to talk us out of this, but then God said, so here we are. So bless them because we're all we're pointing all of this at Greg and Georgia. There is a offering that God established for us to give directly to the people, directly to the persons that God has called to be a spiritual leader for us. One that uh, in, in the Old Testament would have been the priest or the Kohen, and it goes to them. And it's not a tenth. It is not a tenth. It is, it is a gift that goes to those people. Now, calculating the truma is, is a little interesting, okay? The masar is always 10%, so that's easy. But when it comes to calculating the truma, we actually have to look at a few uh, scriptures first. And so here is... Um, very quickly comes... Yeah. You're going to laugh at this one. So how do we calculate the Truma? This is uh, Deuteronomy 18, 3 through 4. This is the share due the priests from the people. So um, you're, you're going to give them the shoulder, the jowls, and the inner parts of the animal you sacrifice. So enjoy that, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Once again, the shoulder, the jowls, and the inner parts go to the priests. Now, if, if, you, if for us who are Gentiles, we're going to need a little of assistance on this. And so for this one, the Lord took us to the Hebrew people. Father, how did they come up with a calculation here? And what the Hebrew people did is they were able to calculate the percentage of of the animal that those three things represented because in that day they knew that and it came up to one fortieth which is 2.5 percent now even within the the hebrew people 2.5 is generous and you can give two or you can give 1.5 percent but listen to this very carefully when the lord told us this we said father we're going to go for it to the fullness of how you show us. And so the Lord showed us, well, 2.5% is the blessing. And so what happened in Tulsa, and this was a tough one for us to teach to our own people because a lot of them, you know, prayed and God said that it went to us. And so here we all are. But, um, but that's, that's the point, isn't it? You pray and you say, Father, who do you want me to give this teruma, this offering to? Who does this go to? Many of you will hear Greg in Georgia. 
because that's who God put into and sewed into the fabric of creation. And so what happens is, is, is now it's a totally new life uh, in our church. People come in and they're giddy and excited because they know that this is a good thing. And they come and they hand us these little envelopes of cash or whatever. And you know what? There are some people, they, they come and they've been blessing us. We've had people cutting our grass for us. Somebody tell me that's beautiful. beautiful. We've, had, we've had people come and clean our house for us. We've had people do all these different things. It's just the heart of giving just opened up. And this blessing that God sowed into creation for taking care of the priests was released. And, and those who stepped in saw huge fruit as a result. So the Teruma is what you would give. Let's just say, just give you an example of what's going on in Tulsa. A paycheck is received before taxes... Before anything else comes out, if, that's a, uh, um, if that paycheck is 1,000 euros, then it would be 25 euros or 2.5%. They take this cash, put it in an envelope, and they slip it into us in a Pentecostal handshake, and, and there it is. You know, and that's it. There's no, we don't take an offering. We don't go around with, you know what I'm saying? We don't do the, the you know, pass the bucket for the truma. We, you know, people can do it or not. And so those who do just hand that to us privately and off we go. So that is the truma. It is before taxes, before anything else, before any expenses, your gross 2.5%. And we do that monthly. And, our, and, and some people do it every two weeks. However God leads you to do it, if you accept the invitation, then go. Um, that's the Teruma. Now, I'm going to read this scripture to you because I, I need to respond to what you're experiencing emotionally right now. <laughs> 1 Kings 17, 13 through 14, tells the story of Elijah who goes to the Gentile woman and he, he asks her to bake him some bread. And she was down to her last drop of oil and her last flour. And so this was all that she had. And this is what Elijah said to her, verse 13 of 1 Kings 17. Don't be afraid. Go home. Do as you have said. Take a small cake of bread from, for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. Now see, Elijah understood God's process. Take a little bit of what you have for the priest and bring it to him. The moment she did that, she opened up God's storehouse of provision and her oil never ran out. Woot! For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry. So God has this in provision and this is how Elijah taught her to respond. Don't be afraid. In Israel, the crops grow and there's this first portion that grows first, this bountiful portion that grows first. And the Hebrew people know what it is. It's the first fruit. It's the part that God gave them so that they'd have something to give to the priests. See, so God's not taking away from you. He wants to bring increase to your life so that you can take care of the priests. And when you do that in His order, the floodgates start to open. And all we want is to see the floodgates open the rest of the way. And when we get to, oh, you're just going to be so excited. Oh, I'm so excited. So now we have, after the Teruma, we have the first of the three applications of Masar, the first tithe. The first tithe you already know about and you've just done this morning, and that tithe in Hebrew is called the Rishon. And the Rishon is the tithe that goes to the synagogue, which would be the church. And so when you give 10%, give 10%. Again, this is an invitation, and we bless you to do as God leads. Pray and ask. 
We're, this is the invitation God gave us, and this is how we responded. That Rishon, uh, for the Hebrews and for us, came before taxes. So it was a 10%. So again, of that 1,000 euro paycheck, 25 euros went to the, uh, the priest, which in this case, the example we're using, Greg and Georgia. And then 100 euros went to the church, the synagogue. That's the Rashan. And um, it's, it's throughout the scripture. It says, I give to the Levites all the tithes. And, and this is the, um, the Masar in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they're doing while serving at the tent of meeting. Um, and this is all from Numbers 18, 21. So the Rashan is the first tithe. You're already doing it. Congratulations. Just by going from not giving to the Rashan and only the Rashan, many people have seen a kiss from heaven, a blessing from God financially or in other way, and they knew that God had done a mighty work. But when you apply all of the coal masar, you cannot imagine the floodgate that comes. Okay, now let's talk about what to do with the other two applications of the masar. This is the 10%. This is, this is um, a, another 10%. And before I scare you, there's not going to be two more 10%, meaning um, a 20% and a 30%. That's not where we're going. Um, but here's the best part. There is a, another tithe. There is a second Masar. And that Masar, that 10%, God has ordained that you take that money and give it to yourself. And give it to yourself. That is the, the second application of the Masar after the Rishon is called the Shanai. The Shanai is the self-tithe. So we're going to read Deuteronomy 14. And we're going to go for the Shanai. We're going to go 22 through 27. And then, and then we'll continue on to get to the last part of the Kol Masar. So what the Lord says, be sure to set aside a tenth, that's the Masar, of all your fields produced each year. And, and it goes through, and this is what it says. It says, exchange the tithe for silver, take the silver with you, and use the silver to buy whatever you like. Cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink. Anything you wish. Now, people obey the Lord. <laughs> then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. Is that beautiful? We could spend months on examples of how we Shanai. Um, because not only do Scott and Sherry Norville Cole Massar, but our church ministry Blue Flame does as well. So the church actually participates in this because there, there are so many opportunities for us to give. We prayed as, as a, a, a ministry and we said, Father... How do you want us to Taruma? And the Lord showed us the person that for this last year, we have been giving them a Taruma every single month. 2.5% off the top. Um, from a Rashan standpoint, we have been um, giving into the teams and... Um, and and using that money to go to the teams and do things with the teams and help the teams and help them help their nation. See, so that's all going back into the teams. And then the Shanai, um, we found that there were people in our church ministry that had a, a call of God and they needed a blessing from the Lord to go and do what God called them to do. Someone tell me that's beautiful. So the Lord showed us to take that Shanai as a... No. Oh, that's Rashan. 
Yes, and, and, and that went into the destiny of those people. Okay, so Sherry and I then, as individuals, we, um, we take that 10%, and we, we literally, we, you know, the Lord says do with it whatever you wish, but being the wise people that we are, we pray every single time. We inquire of the Lord, say, Father, show us how this Shani, this self-tithe can be best given. What can we do with this that's best? And the Lord has shown us different things every time. We've, we've poured into our own family. We've poured into our children. We have, um, we have uh, gone on vacation. We've done all of the different things. We've bought them school clothes. We, we, we've thrown huge celebratory grill the lamb and praise God feasts. And Papa paid for the whole thing. Is that beautiful? Okay, that's the Shani. That's the second application of the Masar. Now, the Shani, that 10% is done for two periods, and then you don't. So it could be, if you, if you chose to do this every year, it would be two years, and then you don't. But for us, it's every month, so we go two months, and we self-tithe. Self-tithe in January, for example. Self-tithe in February. And then in March, we do something different. The something different is the third application of the Masar, which is called Anai. And Anai is where the Lord said this. At the end of every three periods, bring all the Masars of that year's produce and store it in your town so that the Levites and the aliens... The fatherless, the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied. So it's, it's called a poor tithe, which I, we don't like that word very much because that's not, very, it's not the case. But it's when people actually have a need. And, and it's not related to their destiny. It's related to there's, there's, there's something lacking and we're taking care of them. And we found that in Tulsa... Everybody has started this on a different month, and so there's a staggering of who's having an Anai when, and so we're able to provide for Tulsa and for the, uh, anyone that comes into our, um, our family, uh, the fatherless, the widows who live in our towns. We, we're able to pour into them to the poor. And see, what we've been taught is that 10% goes to the church and then we give whatever, you know, is an offering, the, the free-for-all. We just give however we to the poor or to whomever and everything. And there's a lot of freedom in that and that's beautiful. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't stop doing that. But you want to do all of that in addition to this. And this is God's plan. That you would turuma to the priests that you would rishon to the synagogue, that you would shenai to yourself for, for two months, and then in the third month, you give that same 10% to the poor. And then in April, you would start over again. Shenai April, Shenai May, and then June, you give to the poor, and you start over again. And you do that all the way around so that in a 12-month cycle, you have had four anais. Four 10% gifts to the poor. When we implemented this in our lives, it was different than when I had forgotten about tithing and then somebody read that Bible verse and I, sorry, and I started giving my 10% again and God blessed me. He really blessed me for doing that. He kissed me, he gave the, the finances and, and we had breakthrough and it was awesome. But awesome is not floodgate. I mean floodgate. And that's what God has planned for Cyprus. Now, this is not a manipulation. It's an invitation. God wants you to know that he's always had a plan. There's always been a way for this to be done. And he's not trying to cut you deeper, which is exactly what all of us thought when we first started looking at this. It's like, Okay, so we used to give 10, now we're giving 22.5. So how does that benefit us? Can, can you help us with this? And the Lord said, test me on this and see if I will not open the floodgates. And I am here to tell you, we 
tested God per his instructions, and the floodgates have opened. Sherry and I, who have had more, Papa, how are we going to feed our kids? And then he provided at the last minute the wonderful meal. But he, it, we didn't know where certain meals coming from. Sherry and I paid off our house last month. The mortgage is this, and we donated our house to the church, so it's not ours anymore. And I'm just saying that so that you know, we, we, we're still letting go. We're still living on faith. We still trust God for everything. Nothing has changed, but there's just, I mean, I'm, I need to read this sentence again because I have to remind myself, it's just so... See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. If you've not experienced that, you now have the how-to. So everyone looks lovely today. And understand the weather has cooled off a little bit. It's looking like it's going to be a very nice day. Is there anything you would like to add, Miss Cherie? See, I'm not complete without Cherie. Would just be the nice I know. I like how you all say my name here. Because at home it's Sherry. And here it's Cherie. No, don't correct on that one. It makes me feel fancy. And I so love to be fancy. And actually, Scott's dad always called me that. And I miss him so much. And so it's been incredible to be called Cherie all these days. I just, I'll be quick. Um, this really did change our lives, and it really is not uh, a manipulation. You know, for me, I think if I could just tell you the greatest testimony all my life since I was a little girl. I mean, my dad had me tithing since I was little, you know. I got $5, I gave 50 cents on Sunday. And uh, so it's always been something I've been familiar with. But since we've been in ministry past seven years, however long it's been, I've just had this passion that there would be a joy in giving and there would be no need to ever ask. Because it's just who we were created to be. And so for us, and I've kind of had to probably repent and stuff, because um, I, don't, I don't like to take offerings, and, and we've only taken a couple at conferences that we've done at home, and that was only because somebody was going to do it if we didn't. So we figured, well, if we're going to do it, we might as well do it ourselves. But um, what I've seen is a joy in giving to the Lord. And like Scott said, I mean, people come up, and, and I'm going to use actually Surrender's brother-in-law and sister as, as my prime example. They run up to us every single time, so excited. And we've been doing this a year. They were one of the first ones, and they didn't feel like they had extra, you know, because it feels like extra. I know it does when you're hearing it, but it's not, I promise, because you will have more um, than you ever imagined, but they didn't feel like they had extra, so he just started mowing our lawn every week for us. He still does it, and created beautiful flower beds for us, and has just blessed us with his time. But just probably about two months after he chose to do that, they received increase, and they were able to start giving financially the Truma too. We've had people who um, repurposed our kids' clothes um, by taking their winter clothes and sewing them into summer clothes so that we didn't have to buy clothes for the next season and have that expense. And um, I love the Truma because <laughs> it's changed our life, honestly, um, because we've been in ministry for years. And honestly, before the Truma, not many people considered that maybe we had needs except for Iggy and Hoopa, starting Axel and Tov. <laughs> because sometimes we just assume that those that care for us are cared for, 
and we don't know we're part of the care. And I can honestly tell you there have been days, you know, when we first started, it's much different a year later, but when we first started and maybe we needed milk and we got to church and somebody gave us a truma and it, it got us milk plus other things. Or maybe we were out of trash bags. You know, simple things. But those who care for you are worth caring for. And like Scott said, it was a really hard message for us to give at home and ask people to give to us. But it's been so blessed. And I have seen um, the scripture from Psalm, you know, the 23rd Psalm that we will have no lack come forth. And I, but the best part has been seeing it multiply to the giver because that's been something I've always done whenever we've received a donation or an offering, and now Tav does it. <laughs> but I pray blessing for the one that gave. And always my favorite offering still to this day is the quarter that is all somebody had because I know how hard it is to give all you have. But that's what he's invited us to. And I can just tell you for us that um, all the years Scott worked at the bank and made a ton of money, we never had savings. We never went on a vacation. We never did any of those things. And now we're able to do those things. And uh, <laughs> yes, it is a big woot. So I hope you just hear our heart in this, that it's about being restored to the joy of the Lord. And it is his joy that we would care for each other. And I love it. I mean, Shanae month is great, and, but don't skip it because that's the temptation as well. We just, we won't give to ourselves. And we actually had uh, Love, who was here with us last time. They just kept skipping that one. <laughs> and so they were doing the others, but the Lord woke them both up and said, it's important to me that you give to yourself. Because I desire for you to be blessed. I desire for you to be cared for. And I desire for it to be more than paycheck to paycheck. And I know that's a hard word when that might be how you're living right now. But I know that life too. Because that's where we were. And so they went back. The Lord said, I want you to make it up. <laughs> I want you to give me, give to yourself what you didn't. And they did. And it was a huge sacrifice. It was their grocery money. And the next day, their account, they found an error in it, an error in it that was double the amount. Just by being faithful, just by being faithful to him. But I will say my favorite time is the Anai, is when we just get to give away. Because when we quit the job, that was my biggest issue was, oh, I'll do anything for you, Lord, but I don't want to have to stop giving and I felt like I was going to have to, we would have to stop that because we wouldn't have enough. And I really wanted to give. And um, first we got to learn how to receive, which we weren't very good at. Super good at giving, not so good at receiving. So first he taught us to receive, and then he allowed us to give again. And it's been just such an incredible thing to see somebody has a need and you get to be his answer. You get to be his provision. And it's because you have more than enough. And from the beginning, when we started, before quitting the job, the Lord gave us a word. And he said, I will give you more than enough. Receive what you need and give the rest away. It's all the kingdoms. And I can just tell you through that journey that um, I didn't think I'd be saying <laughs> in those moments when we didn't know how we were going to feed the dogs, <laughs> that our house had been paid off and that um, we have no debt. You know, that we went from 20 more years of whatever, our mortgage, to none. And just from taking a risk, just from being faithful, and we've seen him provide in so many ways and through so many sources, because he doesn't want one thing to ever be our source except him. And so he's done it in such a variety of ways and, and that we could never claim it to be any source but him. So again, it is an invitation. And please, if you feel 
guilt or anything like that. Just give it back to the enemy because that's where it came from. <laughs> and truly, if you feel, gosh, this is so stretching and you could only do one thing, the most important of them is the teruma. It's the first fruit. You know, the women that traveled, you know, with Jesus and the disciples, there were women that traveled with him and it said that they were the ones that funded his ministry, well, it was their terumas. They were giving to the one that gave to them. And when women got married in that day, they had a, an alabaster jar, and it was sealed, and it was saved for their husband. And on the day of their wedding, they anointed his feet and head, which I could talk for a year about because I think that's so awesome. But the point is it was the teruma of her dowry, the teruma of her dowry was, was given to anoint her husband. And so that's all. <laughs>